So this brings us to uh, atoms, thinking about materials. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, take you through the hydrogen atom. I would take you through more than that, but uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, the hydrogen atom is really the well, the hydrogen atom and the uh, ionized helium atom are what we can solve. One electron systems. Uh, we then use perturbation methods to look at uh, many body problems. Uh, but I thought I, I would. We go through this, you get an idea of where uh, the mathematics of, of atoms come from. And a lot of the times when we're talking about bonding, we talk about bonding in terms of uh, atomic orbitals. And, and this is where, where they originate from. So the simple hydrogen atom. It's 35 pages of notes, so it's not that simple. But we're not going to go through all the math. Uh, we'll leave that for, for uh, uh, recreation. Uh, so the simple hydrogen atom, you've got uh, a nucleus and you've got an uh, electron. And I drew them bigger because they're not drawn to scale. Maybe the, maybe the nucleus is closer to us, so it, it's out of proportion. Uh, the nucleus has some momentum, proton, it has some mass, and you pick some origin here, it has some position. The electron also has some position, Re, it has some momentum, and it has some mass. So if we want to talk about uh, this, we have to write the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is the uh, kinetic energy of the proton plus the kinetic energy of the electron plus the potential. And in this case, it will be P, P squared over 2 M, P plus P E squared over 2 M E minus the charge of an electron squared over R P minus R B, the distance between them. Uh, note that uh, there's no 4 pi's or other uh, pesky parameters. Uh, these are CEGS units. Okay, so we got that. But the problem is it becomes complicated, right? We're dealing with Cartesian space, we're dealing with two particles. So what we want to do instead is we want to change, <clears throat> instead of thinking of, of these things moving like this, we want to think of the proton moving and the electron moving around it. Right? Which one? The electron. Oh, E, uh, charge of electron. Charge. If this is a, a Coulomb attraction between the uh, a nucleus and the electron. So we're going to translate our coordinate system from a static coordinate system and two things moving to uh, uh, a center of mass system in which we have the whole system moving and then the electron moving relative to that. So doing that, we have a change of colors here, so I don't have to erase the pink that I've done, pink yet. What we can do is we can define a new coordinate system, R, where R is the distance between the uh, nucleus and the uh, proton. We've got some center of mass. We've got a distance from our origin and the center of mass, which I'm calling capital R. This combined system is moving with some P capital R. 
that's the uh, mass of the uh, center, of the uh, momentum of the center of mass. And then the electron has p little r. That's the momentum of the electron zipping around the uh, nucleus. R is the distance from the original unit to from the center of mass? R is the distance from the origin to the system center of mass. Uh, that, that's, that's capital R. Uh, P sub capital R is the momentum of the center of mass. Little r is the distance from the nucleus to the electron. And P sub little r is the momentum of the electron. So in doing this transform, uh, we identify the center of mass r is equal to me r e over m. MP plus MP RP over ME plus MP, or R is equal to ME RE plus MP RP over ME plus MP. So we've got an expression for the center of mass. Yeah. Sorry, are we moving into a frame centered around? Uh, R, where R is that? Or we have a, yes, it's going to be centered around this center of mass. Yeah. All right. So we don't have to keep, keep track of uh, both of these anymore. We're now going to talk about uh, the motion of the electron around that. Uh, OK, so we've got this. And we also know that you know, little r is the difference between RE and RP. I wrote that down somewhere in my notes. Good. Oh, maybe this took this common knowledge. Any, anyway, uh, okay, so doing this quantum transformation, uh, really a couple of approaches. One is uh, <clears throat> Over here and do it. Why don't I? One approach is to say, I'll skip over here and say, we're transforming from RE, RP to R and R. Okay. So, one approach is to kind of appeal to the physics of the situation in, in which we say that uh, there's a total momentum which I'm going to call capital P, so I'm going to put a little foot on it, is equal to PE plus PP. And we can talk about the relative velocity. V is equal to V1 minus V2. And we can talk about relative momentum. P equal to M V. So this M is going to be the reduced mass so place that M the mu. Mu is equal to M P M E over M P plus M E. Okay, so we've got a reduced mass, which means that the relative.
relative momentum is m p m e over m p plus m e b e minus p. Then m p over m p plus m e p m e b e <coughs> minus m e over m p plus m e m p v p so that is the momentum of the electron that is the momentum of the proton and now using this and using this those two equations we can solve to find uh, the momentum and the uh, of the electron and the momentum of the proton in terms of the uh, relative and the absolute uh, momentums. Which so use these. Find P E P P in of P P and then substitute that into here. And if we do that, we're going to get. We're going to get H is equal to E squared over 2M plus P squared over 2 mu minus E for R. That mu is our reduced mass, and this capital M is equal to. Uh, and P, the total mass of the system. But this is a classical expression, and we can, you know, perform our you know, little quantization trick and get H is equal to negative H bar squared over <coughs> 2 M del R squared minus h bar squared over 2 mu del little r squared minus e squared over r. And that's one way to get at it. But it does rely on you know, this kind of semi-hokey approach. Uh, so what I want to show you is that there's another, another technique we can use that's mathematically a little bit, a little bit more kosher. Not anything in physics it really is. Physics people do a lot of really bad math, but it happens to work out. Uh, it's okay. Engineers do it worse. We get it in the right way. So let's take a better approach. Uh, yeah. Uh, this might be a silly question, but did you switch out of the CDS units for the last equation on the board? Then? No. So, okay. Did I miss something? No, no, no. I'm just checking. No, no, no. I left them in there. It's basically CGS is getting rid of the four pi epsilon. Uh, the H bars are. The H bars are still there. The H bars are coming from uh, uh, when we talked about uh, quantizing momentum, and we said, oh, momentum is, you know, h bar squared over 2m <coughs> derivatives. Uh, no, he says, i h bar squared. No. 
momentum is i h bar derivative with respect to position. And then we take and we square that. So we get the i squared gives us minus 1 h bar squared and then the Laplacian. Uh, but it's the Laplacian because it's, it's a, uh, in three dimensions. So did this, other questions about this? Okay, so the other approach, which is a little more appealing, is to simply say that Hamiltonian is equal to negative h bar squared over 2 mp del rp squared minus h bar squared over 2 me del r e squared minus E squared over R and then does your charge not need to be absolute there? Yep, should be. I like that because a lot of times people just say E is the charge on the electron and they don't take into account whether it's positive or negative. And I always find that confusing when I'm looking at notes to know whether or not I'm putting a negative sign into the equation. So I, I always just put the absolutes because it gives me peace of mind that whatever I'm doing, I'm just putting the, the magnitude. So if you write out your, if you write out your uh, expression, recognizing that your Laplacian the vectors. So we're going to use that any coordinate transformation from say x, y to p, q. Yeah. Do a chain rule substitution. This is kind of the, the basis for any time that you're dealing with a, a coordinate transformation, and part of your coordinate transformation is a transformation involving derivatives. Again, we've got vectors here, uh, but you can go in and, and apply it to the Laplacian. And when you do that, you get out the same Hamiltonian. So, 
the Hamiltonian? That the Hamiltonian that depends only on the position of the system. And the second two terms depend only on the relative position of the electron from the proton. That we've already seen before, right? This is just a particle in free space. It's the relative position from the center of mass that we have defined for the second two terms, right? It's the relative position from the. Uh, this is. is plus minus r. This is r. So big R is the position of the system as the system translates. The little r is the distance from the proton to the electron. So what we have here is this big R. It's just a free particle. It's a time point. Yeah. Is it little r the distance from the uh, nucleus to the electron, or from the center of mass to the electron? I thought it was this to the electron. Okay. Because we, we defined all of our relative coordinates, uh, example here, as, as, the, as the distance between them. Okay. Uh, this part, this first part, is just a free particle. So if we're talking about the atom alone, we can write it as a plane wave. This is a uh, not that this is actually the part we're going to have to solve, uh, and that's what's going to take another 30 pages, which we'll, we'll skip over most of the math here. Uh, what's also important is that because these are separable, we know that we can write tote is equal to er plus r. So if you take uh, hydrogen atoms and you're zipping them in space. You know, the total energy is just the sum of the energy due to the translation of the atom on the whole, plus the energy of associated with the electron and the uh, proton interacting with each other. And as kind of a last statement before calling it quits for the day, I want to point out that uh, the same technique can be used to uh, uh, simplify other many particle systems. For example, if you had three particles, you have some one, two, three. What we could do is we could first. <coughs> Identify a center of mass between particle one and particle two, and form a transformation, and then find the second center of mass from the original to uh, the the next. And if you're doing that, it allows you to write out the, the Hamiltonian. The problem with it is that unlike the hydrogen atom, uh, you still have these three body interactions. So you're not going to be able to get this nice separable solution. So hydrogen, we're able to bring it into a uh, single part of the problem and treat the uh, nucleus just as though it's a, a total atom, total uh, uh, translation of the system. Uh, if, for example, we want to do this for you know, lithium or, or helium, uh, we couldn't do this. It, it's still going to be. Uh, is still going to have a potential term over here, which isn't going to allow us to, to separate the variables. So what I'd like to do now is to take this refocus the discussion 
purely on the motion of the electron around the uh, uh, nucleus. So uh, this is what we've got. And the way that we're talking about it is the uh, electron and is moving around this proton. Now, we could write this out and solve it, presumably, uh, but that doesn't make a lot of sense because we're clever enough to realize that we basically have uh, a particle that's trapped in a central potential, right? So what makes the most sense, right, because after all, this R is the distance between the nucleus, which we're treating as the origin, and the electron. So what makes the most sense is to transform coordinate systems from rectilinear coordinates systems to spherical coordinates. And in doing that, we're going to use <coughs> r, the distance from the origin to the uh, point of interest, and then theta, the distance from the z-axis to the uh, point of interest, and then phi, which is the angle between the x-axis and the point of interest in the xy plane. And there are different ways to use this notation. So I've seen sometimes that the phi and the theta is switched, but uh, for here, this is what we're going to be using. And you know, in case you're not familiar with, with this type of coordinate transformation, we'll have our r, which is a function of x, y, and z. And we need to transform that into r, theta, and phi using that r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Theta is equal to the arc cosine of z over the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And phi is equal to the arc tangent of y over x. Just basic geometry. Uh, if you're looking for a good reference, uh, George Arfin has a good book. A R F A E N. I think it was called uh, Mathematical Methods for Physicists or Mathematics of Physics or, or whatever. I can't exactly remember, but basically he goes through. Uh, over the course of the book, all the math that you need to really be able to dissect uh, classical and, and modern uh, physics. So there's all the coordinate transformations, there's uh, you know, vector fields, uh, a little bit of calculus of variation, uh, but it, it's a very good reference and you can pick up a used copy uh, pretty cheaply. And if you uh, do that, you'll find that with this coordinate transformation, the Laplacian becomes 1 over r squared d by the r, r squared d by the r plus 1 over r squared sine theta d by d theta sine theta d by d theta plus 1 over r squared sine squared theta d squared by d theta squared. Yeah, there's a lot of math 
in these notes. And I'm going to skip through a lot of that. And again, I am going to be releasing these. Uh, I go blow by blow how to solve all the calculus. Uh, but for the sake of uh, simplicity, I'm going to uh, be jumping ahead and you just recognize that the notes on the hydrogen atom, uh, which come along with the lecture, uh, are 35 pages of math. So you can actually see where it all comes from. <clears throat> so this is going to substitute in for the Laplacian. Um, and then our uh, magnitude of r is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Uh, so, H E R two E E P. That's where we're at. What we're going to find, and which we'll show here, is that uh, the functional form of this is such that we can split up the angular components and the radial components. So separation of variables still works, which means that phi r theta phi is equal to some function of r and some function of theta phi. <clears throat> and over the course of uh, substituting this into here and here, and substituting this into here and this into here, yeah. Um, in the Laplacian, should that be the second derivative of phi on the end? Or did you still oh, oh, yes, 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 phi. Sorry, phi squared. Sorry, Thank you very much. Phi squared. Yes, exactly. Thank you. And for the sine squared, phi? That is... Let me double, double check the whole thing. R squared dr. R squared by dr. Uh, no, that's, that's theta still. Okay. Uh, 1 over sine squared theta d by d theta, sine theta d by d theta, plus 1 over r squared sine squared theta, d squared by d phi squared. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, with this substitution and a little bit of algebra, we wind up with... Wind up with, I'll write this out. You wind up with some term which is a function of R only is equal to some term which is a function of theta and phi only, and the only way that those two terms can be equal to each other is if they're equal to a constant. And again, the details are in the notes, and when you get this expression, it means that we can now break it up into two equations to solve. One equation will look like this r squared h r squared over r r over r squared d by r r squared d by d r plus r squared 2 u e equals constant.
constant, and the other term looks like negative h bar squared over y theta phi 1 over sine theta d by d theta sine theta d by d theta y theta phi minus h bar squared over y theta phi 1 over sine squared theta d by d phi y theta phi is equal to k. And these become the two problems that we have to solve. And I'd like to begin by focusing just on the radial part. So this radial part, you'll notice <clears throat> that we've got a uh, 1 over y, and here we've got a 1 over y, and we've got a y here, and we've got a y here which means that we can take this y over to this side, collect <clears throat> these two together, and we'll have something that looks like negative h bar squared 1 over sine theta d by d theta sine theta d by d theta plus 1 over sine squared theta d by d phi oh I'm sorry right here this term should be squared so sine squared d by d phi squared y theta B is equal to k y theta b. And this is an operator. And this is a value. So it's an eigenvalue, and that makes this an eigenvalue eigenfunction relation, which means that. This is uh, an operator, it gives us a measurable, and you have all those wonderful properties of having uh, eigenfunctions that are orthonormal that we can use for things. So to jump ahead and to spoil the surprise, I'll tell you that this operator goes by the name L, capital L squared. So this capital L squared is the uh, square of L, which is the uh, angular momentum. And actually, I should call this the orbital angular momentum, because we can have orbital angular momentum, which has to do with the electron you know, circling around the proton, or we can have spin angular momentum, and then we'll come to that uh, a little bit later. And also, to continue with uh, spoiling the surprise for you, this k, which is our eigenvalues, uh, take the value h bar squared little l, l plus 1. So l is a quantum number, and that's going to be the, the solution to our problem. So let's talk about angular momentum some. Angular momentum, uh, 
I said we can have orbital angular momentum and we can have spin angular momentum. And when we think about these, um, you know, electrons moving around a, a proton, classically you think of it as zipping around, but we know that that classical picture doesn't really work uh, because we don't have, uh, you know, electrons that are stationary and you can follow it around, but nonetheless they, they still have angular momentum. And the way that we think about angular momentum is through its interaction with magnetic fields. And we're able to measure the orbital angular momentum through the electron's interaction with magnetic fields. And this is also where we know the spin angular momentum comes from. We know that if we measure all of the angular momentum, that we still have something we can't explain, and that has been uh, designated a spin momentum. Uh, a spin momentum does not have a physical meaning. It's not an electron spinning around. It's just a term that we used because we needed a term and it sounds catchy. I don't know. This is probably some, some historical evolution where this term came from. But what you should know is that if you try to approximate it through a, a, a ball with a charge on the outside spinning around, it does not work. Uh, so it's purely a, a quantum phenomenon. So if we think about angular momentum from a, a classical perspective, L which is a vector quantity, is the position crossed into the momentum, which means that it is uh, x, y, z crossing into px, py, pz, or y, P Z minus Z P Y Z P X minus X P Z X P Y minus Y P X. And then we can designate these as Y uh, L X L Y L Z. So each one of these components of the angular momentum can be expressed as in terms of position and momentum. Now, because we know what these uh, momentum and, and, and uh, position operators are that correspond to these, that means that if we have our L, uh, operator, the LX operator, LY operator, LZ operator, but then we can write these as negative I H bar Y D by DZ minus Z D by DY negative i h bar z d by dx minus x d by dz minus i h bar x d by dy minus y d by dx. So each one of these components have associated with it a operator that is uh, mathematically tractable, something that we can work with. And if you want to uh, uh, write this out in a more compact form, you say L is equal to negative I H bar R uh, del squared, or sorry, R dot del. And that's uh, a handier way to write this out. So we've got that. Let's look at the properties of these operators, and that will tell us about what we can do with them. And again, I'm Gonna skip some of the, skip some of the, the steps here. Uh, let's 
let's say that we take the LX operator and the LY operator and we look to see if they commute. Well, that gives us y minus t c minus t d y z p x minus x p z and you can multiply those out and with you know a page of algebra uh, what comes out of this is y p x p z z minus y p x z p z plus x p y z p z minus x p y p z z which can simplify to y p x p z z plus x p y z p z and remember these don't commute right these are i uh, minus i h bar so that gives us y p x negative i h bar plus x p y minus i h bar and this is this so it's equal to i h bar LZ operator. So they don't commute, which is definitely not equal to zero. So what this means is it means that we can measure the angular momentum, sort of, uh, and you'll see what I mean by that, but we can't know simultaneously any more than one component. And you can do the same exercise for all the components. You see that none of the components of the angular momentum commute with each other. So this tells us the limit to our knowledge, saying that we can know one element of a vector quantity, but we can't know the other two. this. We take our uh, L squared, which I told you that was the, op the name of the operator we were working at before. Well, that is L dot L equal to LX squared plus LY squared plus L z squared and if you take L squared and say Lx uh, if you go through half a page of algebra they commute. So what this tells us is that we can know the magnitude of the orbital angular momentum, and we can know one component, but we can't simultaneously know all three components. So let's take these expressions, which we've written in Cartesian coordinates, and transform those into spherical coordinates, because that's what we're working in. And doing so, 
again, it's another page of algebra, you wind up with Lx is equal to negative i h bar minus sine uh, phi d by d theta minus cotangent theta cosine phi d by d phi ly is equal to negative i h bar cosine phi d by d theta minus cotangent theta sine phi d by d phi and lz is equal to negative i h bar d by d phi. So now we have to pick one of these to solve. What should we pick? The short let's pick one. Z. Yes, let's pick Z. So we're going to solve the uh, eigenvalue problem for the Z component. And before I go on, since I want to follow my notes as truly as I can, if L squared is equal to negative H bar squared, 1 over sine theta d by d theta sine theta d by d theta plus 1 over sine squared theta d squared by d v squared. So these are all the operators that we're going to work with in uh, spherical coordinates. Okay, taking the z component, we have lz v is equal to theta z v. And I know that I might think about phi because there's no theta in this operator. Great. Say so what? Lowercase l? Uh, lowercase l. That's, that's going to be a, an eigenvalue. So I, I'm making my operators capitals with hats, and I'm making my values uh, lowercase letters, and then I'm making my functions. Uh, let me write this. Uh, Actually, I write this in a little bit different format to try to stay self-consistent. Uh, B, B, L, D, D, D. So I know that this operator is only a function of, of uh, phi, which means that when I'm writing out my operator function, I'm operating on a function of phi only, which, by the way, you'll see that our uh, solution is separable. But nonetheless, this is what we've got. We've got a beautiful, well-behaved operator, which tells us then that uh, our solution is a exponential. Negative i h bar d by d uh, phi, our operator, is equal to some alpha E D I M phi to H bar M alpha E D I M phi. So these are our item functions, and that is our measurable item value. Um, and we got this alpha. Well, the alpha, we need that to be picked to be normalizable. And we know that uh, that phi value, uh, if I take and integrate, I made a mistake there. Uh, if I 
take this and the phi goes 0 to 2 pi, so I integrate from 0 to 2 pi d phi of phi star phi 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 has to be normalized to 1, and if I do that, I, I get alpha is equal to 1 over square root of 2 pi. So we can go in here and put in 1 over square root of 2 pi. So now we have a, normal, a normalized uh, eigenfunction. Uh, what's more, we know that as this function goes around in the circle, that when it goes from 0 to 2 pi, it comes back on itself, you have boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions tell us that uh, v 0 is equal to v at 2 pi which means that m is equal to 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, da, 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 da. m's got to be energies. And uh, ta-da! That's the uh, angular orbital momentum in any one direction. And using the measurable values, h bar m, and m is quantized, and it's normalized, and it's wonderful, delectable, easy to work with. Uh, so let's go back, let's go back and look at, let's go back and look at uh, L squared. Okay, L squared is a little, little hairier. Uh, So let's, let's write this out. Uh, what do we know about L squared? Well, we, we know that L squared y theta phi is equal to, I'm going to call this LSQ, y theta phi. So we know that. And we also know, we also know that L squared and LZ commute. Well, the definition of commuting is that they necessarily share eigenfunctions. And if they share eigenfunctions, then that means that I know an eigenfunction. And if this so happens, you can take y theta phi and split this up using separation of variables and have our angular uh, function y and phi, uh, theta and phi a function of theta as a function of phi. And you know, kind of the hint here is, is that if you see that this is an eigenfunction, that means there has to be some way that this goes away and just leaves you that, that phi value. <coughs> Sorry, Dr. Bagman. Yeah. Oh, it's the uh, subscript in that top line there. Oh, here, uh, SQ for SQ. square, because okay. I was calling it L squared. So we've got this guy, and we know it's separable. So let, let's go back and let's let's uh, let's look at let's look at uh, how this separates. And again, this is going to be a page of algebra, so I will set it up and give you the answer. Uh, Theta, theta, phi, 
plus 1 over sine squared d by d b squared squared. The variable on that sine squared? Uh, theta. Thank you. Sine squared theta, d by d phi squared theta phi is equal to L S Q theta phi. Uh, this term has no phi in it, which means that's going to pass over here. Uh, this term has no uh, phi in it. Oh, actually, it does. It does. This term. I do there. Ah, the theta isn't operated on by the uh, by the phi, which means I can pull it over here, so I can make that theta. This, we know this because we know, uh, we know, we know what phi is. So we take phi and substitute in there, they're the same function, right? They have to be the same function because the operators commute. And when you do that, uh, that's going to give us uh, this is going to give us uh, phi minus m squared. Which then means we have uh, theta sine squared d by d theta sine theta d by d theta theta, theta sine squared theta phi, negative m squared squared theta phi. Got it. And what we'll do now is we'll divide everything through by 1 over phi, which will kill off those, those, and those, and it will leave us with the equation 1 over sine theta d by d theta sine theta d by d theta minus L S Q minus m squared over sine squared theta 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 equals 0. And this is called the Jean equation. Which has been solved uh, before quantum mechanics and with a little bit of algebra with this we wind up with Theta, right? Capital theta function of little theta uh, now has two. 
two quantization numbers, an L and an M, which is equal to minus 1 raised to the M, 2 L plus 1, L minus M factorial over 2 L plus M factorial raised to the 1 half P L M cosine theta if M is greater than or equal to 0 or equal to minus 1 raised to the M theta L M L absolute value of M theta if M less than zero. This is the known solution to the Legendre equation. This P term that is called the associated Legendre functions. written out as P L to the M of some function X, and in our case we've got cosine theta we substitute in, is equal to minus 1 to the M, 1 minus X squared, M over 2, D, total derivative of D by D X, M P L X where P L X is equal to 1 over 2 to the L L factorial D D L by D X to the L x squared minus 1 to the L. Boom. Okay, it's a bunch of math. It's a bunch of math, but at the end of the day, what you see is that because we have this known solution, we have a known equation, we have a known solution, which we can substitute in for, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when we substitute this in for our y, Theta V is equal to uh, theta V. We're going to get negative one to the M two L plus one. L minus M factorial over 4 pi L plus M factorial If 
m is less than zero. So this L, this Y, notice now it has two uh, characteristic numbers, an L and an M. And in this case, we have L and then a minus M. And these L and M's, L equals 0, 1, 2, dot, dot. M is equal to minus L, minus L, plus 1, dot, 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 0, dot, 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 L. So our L and M are appropriately bracketed. This is called a spherical harmonic. It's written out in terms of the associated Legendre functions. And it's crazy useful. This is the spherical equivalent of a plane wave. So, you know, those of you familiar with, with uh, uh, Fourier, uh, Fourier expansions and plane waves, you know that any function you can write out as a sum of plane waves. Right? So you can basically take a Fourier expansion of anything that's piecewise continuous. And even, even if it's not piecewise continuous, you can, uh, uh, you'll get, you know, Gibbs overshoots there, but you can still approximate it. Uh, this is the same thing, but for spherical functions. You can fit any spherical function to spherical harmonics, and it's incredibly useful. Uh, it's also useful because uh, it's normalized. It's normalized uh, on a sphere. So if you take y l m star y l m d omega, this d omega means you're integrating over a sphere, so you have uh, things that look like this, 0 to pi d phi integral 0 pi d theta sine theta y l m star y l m. Uh, if you have that, is equal to del L L prime. Let me, uh, sorry, I want to put a prime here in front of these. So that's y star L prime M prime and del M M prime. So we get Kronecker deltas. So it behaves the same as a Fourier expansion as well because it's uh, orthonormal. So if L and M are equal to L prime, L, M prime, then integrating this will give you a value of one. Uh, this is all around a useful function. And uh, as most of you probably guessed, this is where we get our, uh, our uh, S, P, D, uh, F orbitals from. We refer to L equals zero, one, two, three, as S, P, D, F. And this is for hydrogen when we get to many body systems. In the case of many body systems, atoms with more than one electron, we can say that the total angular momentum, the total orbital angular momentum, is equal to the sum. I, and then L, 0, 1, 2, and we call this capital S, capital P, capital D, capital S. L is our uh, orbital angular momentum. 
momentum uh, quantum number. And M, we're calling the magnetic quantum number. Theta, you wind up with things that look like at this is Z at at. These are our miracles. Etc. You can get the P's and the S's as well. Uh, so this gives us the Y component. leaves us with still needing to solve the radio component. Taking this H and applying the R, R like that, uh, we're able to further split up the problem and split the problem up into a uh, Hamiltonian that's acting only on the radial part of the wave function, and then we've got this eigenfunction or eigenvalue coming out with it. So we've got this eigenvalue relationship. And if you remember early, this is what we had, and I showed you in the last lecture that this is the uh, uh, eigenvalues for the angular uh, components. So we've got our little L's in there. And this is the problem that we're going to solve this time. And OK, so this is what we've got. And this is our Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian, if we look at it, uh, we can see that this part is essentially coming from here. So this part is the radial part of the Laplacian. It's the radial part of the kinetic energy. E, kinetic energy. And what that means is that we can essentially say, well, this isn't exactly a potential, 
but we're going to call this an effective potential. And plotting those out, uh, you have like that, that's Coulomb. And then this effective potential looks like this. And the reason it looks like that is because we have this term, which we're going to call our uh, angular momentum barrier. It's going to be something like this. So essentially, it means that this radial Hamiltonian, you've got the kinetic energy, you've got an effective potential. The effective potential has the true potential, the Coulomb potential, and then we've got this other potential which is pushing the electrons away from the nucleus, and that is due to the angular momentum barrier. So we find that you know, Bohr gets the right answer. He gets the right answer for the wrong reasons, but he was right in as much as it is the angular momentum which is keeping the electron from spiraling into the nucleus, and is providing a effective potential, which is uh, giving us this shape of well that we're working with. <clears throat> now, talking about a well, we're, we're basically solving a, uh, a particle in a well, or this is what you know, first year uh, or first semester quantum students solve all the time. You have a, a particle and it bangs against a box or bangs against a well, and we, they solve for it, or you solve for a simple harmonic oscillator. This is essentially that same problem, and what we should notice is that here, below zero, the electron is bound, and it's going to have these discretized energy levels. Above the zero point of energy, the electron is actually free to move away. It's not bound anymore, which means that it can take a continuum of energy levels. Right? It's just like a particle in free space. <clears throat> now, these uh, unbound states, they're very important. We use them for things such as scattering. So if you have a, an atom, an electron comes in, bounces off of that, well, you're writing all of your solutions in terms of these unbound states. They're the, the states above, uh, they're the states of electrons interacting with the atom that are not necessarily stuck. These are the states that are confined. These are the core electrons, the valence electrons. And we're going to confine our solution to the bound states, uh, well, because we're solving part of them in a box again, and those of us in materials, most of the time, we're interested in bonding and the, the localized states, but, but recognize that these unbound states are, are also important. So we're only going to be solving for uh, uh, here. <clears throat> so a lot of what we're going to be doing here is, is going through a series of substitutions, which mathematically is a little bit tedious, so I'm going to be skipping a lot of the math because you have the notes. But I'll, I'll step through the explanation for why we're doing it as best I can. Uh, I mean, a lot of it is we do it because we get the right answer, uh, or it puts it in, in the proper form, but we'll, we'll 
think rationally about what we're doing and why we're doing it, and uh, leave the notes. for the play-by-play uh, -play substitution and uh, simplification. Okay, where are we at here? Uh, so, R squared. This is the differential equation we're solving. R is a function of little r. I've moved all of these over to get, uh, to get rid of the coefficients in front of that, that first term. And we're going to substitute Speaking, we're just solving an ordinary differential equation, uh, but please uh, overlook my notation here. Uh, So I made the substitution and then I put V effective back in, which V effective was uh, <clears throat> So those two substitutions bring us to here. bad and forward now making one more substitution or one more set of substitutions that because of this relationship Which is 
actually not a, a bad looking problem to solve, right? That's something you can imagine someone will give you and you, you think, well, that's probably solvable. And it, it is, it's just not as easy as it may look on the surface. But we'll step through it. So what are the, what are the, implica what are the implications of this? Well, uh, Consider the case of a large row, which is large R, far away from the nucleus. In a case that you're far away from the nucleus, this problem simplifies to expect to see when we are far from the, uh, the nucleus. And in this case, the solution, you know, I'm going to change colors here to denote different limits. That depends. I hate to not uh, use those. So, so in the case of a large row, I'll use blue here. Uh, okay, so this is what we got. Our solution for this is U equals A e to the minus rho over 2 plus B e to the plus rho over 2. But as rho goes to infinity, U has to go to 0, right? Because we know that we're bound, so the electron is not going to... Uh, blow up as we uh, go out to infinity. And, and that means that B has to be zero. So this tells us that in the limit of large rho, our solution will look like U goes as E to the minus rho over two. Okay, now we'll switch to just a red. And we'll consider this case of small row. What do we get as we approach the nucleus? Solve to Q 
Q equals L plus 1, or Q is equal to minus L. Which means that all this means that U is equal to A rho to the negative L plus B rho to the L plus 1. And as rho goes to 0, uh, U has to be finite. U, uh, so again, it can't blow up, which means that A has to go to 0. So this is telling us uh, that we're looking for a solution of the form Okay, so combining these two together and switching colors yet again, we know that our solution so L U T I O N must act like as e to the minus rho over 2, rho to the L plus 1. So this will give us the, the proper behavior in, in both limits. And if we take this and, and look at what the shape of such a function is, function is giving us something that looks like u rho rho. It's going to be something like this. Zero, zero, one, two. So basically, we're creating a radial function and as we increase L, the uh, solution gets clumped together in, uh, and this is going to be spherically symmetric, of course, because this is a radial function, uh, further and further away. And this obeys our in instinct, because we think about what we know of the hydrogen atom. We know that as we increase the atomic number Z, L increases, and basically we're populating uh, larger states out here. So this, this is the right functional form. Okay. So the way that we're going to make headway is we're going to take a polynomial expansion. Plus 2L plus 
2 minus rho d by total derivative of d by d rho plus lambda minus L minus 1. All this quantity multiplied by g rho, where is equal to 0, where g of rho is equal to sum j equals 1 infinity c j rho to j. And this This is called the Laguerre uh, differential equation. And the great thing about having an equation with a name is oftentimes there's a solution with a name that goes along with it. And in this case, it has one. So we've been able to take express that big mess in, in terms of something that, that has a solution. So let's, let's write the solution down. The solution is, and I'm going to write the eigenvalues first. So I started it, but like, I don't know what everything we're going to do. The solution is this. E n is equal to minus 1 over n squared r u. Those are our eigenvalues. r mu, that is the Rydberg constant. Or I shouldn't, it's not exactly the Rydberg constant. It's, well, let me write it here h bar squared over 2 mu a is the Rydberg constant in which we are using our reduced mass instead of using the mass of the electron. Through the through the diffraction grading, and you're getting all of the the diffraction the uh, spectral lines. That's that Rydberg constant, and that's approximately 13.6 electron volt. That a naught equal to h bar squared over m e squared, which is approximately 0. 5 to 9 angstrom is the or radii or radius. All good things. Uh, and uh, if we take and we uh, make the substitution, we get, uh, well, actually, I should say, let's substitute in. R0 and R mu and A mu into this equation, and we get negative 1 over n squared mu e to the fourth over 2 h bar squared. And in the case of mu and m are equal, this is exactly the solution to. Uh, or is hydrogen atom. So Bohr got the right answer for the wrong reasons, although his intuition was right that it's the angular momentum that is quantizing the, uh, the problem. 
Okay, so now let, let's let's write the uh, the radial wave function, which is a page full, but we'll write it. Feel happy with ourselves for for doing so. Just that sense of completeness when you actually write everything out. associated with Greer polynomials. by L must be less than or equal to N minus 1. This is that convenient. Uh, oh. So, real quick. Did you need to have two ones right after each other there? Oh, no I didn't, sorry. That's an L. Thanks. N minus L minus 1 minus K. Yeah, this guy just chose up here. And we're summing K, so K will eventually go into that. So we get, so that means that we now have a wave function if B is equal to R, which is now a function of both N and L, R and Y, which is a function of L and M, V. So our wave function like that is now a function of n, l, n, m. And n, take value of 1, 2, 3. L is bracketed to be 0, 1, 2, up to n minus 1, according to our uh, associated with rear polynomial and m bracketed by minus l zero plus l and i i can't 
can't remember. Uh, I've, I've seen the, the proof of that. I can't remember if I showed that in the last lecture or not. Uh, but it, it is bracketed by that. So there we are. And uh, what these look like, what the radial components look like. As they look something like, and I've got all these plotted out. Uh, what I want to show you about them, though, is as they look like this. R zero. down in here, and the number of nodes is equal to the number of the value of n. So, so basically, if you have n equals zero, then this is, you know, we think of our s orbitals, and they taper out. If you have uh, n equals uh, one, it crosses the x-axis, or sorry, it crosses the uh, uh, zero axis at one time. Uh, two, it crosses it twice, and these are giving us really the, the number of nodes in our wave function. Because remember, we're interested in the charge and our, our charge density. Charge. I know that I used rho here before. Let's call it. Let's just call this charge. Or probability. That's it. Big P. The probability of finding the electron psi star psi, psi, which means that if we're looking at the probability as a function of r, it's going to do something like this, or or n equals one. n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2, and at these points, we get nodes. So you have distinct points in your wave function where the charge goes to 0. You can think of it as kind of giving you rings. I don't know if you remember from a freshman uh, chemistry class, when you start talking about the s orbitals, you say, oh, you have the s orbitals, and you know, n equals 1, have a sphere, and then you've got a sphere inside a sphere, and a sphere inside a sphere. What goes coming about uh, from these nodes? Uh, embrace these. This n we refer to as the principal quantum number. And it's really important because the energy is given exclusively by the letter n. L is the angular momentum.
um, and is getting the, the decomposed thing of momentum. And we write everything out in a, in a summarized fashion. <clears throat> Here, I'll summarize where we are. I should say we've got H acting away function and L M returns negative Rickford constant over n squared psi n L M. If we look at the Angular momentum squared. We return h bar squared l l plus one and l m. If we look at the z component of the angular momentum, we get h bar m and l m. All good things. And as this kind of implies to you, H L squared equals H L Z equals L squared L Z equals zero. They all commute, so we can simultaneously know the energy, the magnitude of the angular momentum and the Z component. Two. These are our s orbitals, our p orbitals, and our d orbitals. This is m equals zero. This is m equals minus one, zero, plus one. m equals minus two, minus one, zero, one, two. And <coughs> up here, Keep going high enough. These are our unbound states. And that is up at e equals zero. So we keep getting closer and closer to the point where the electrons are able to break free. So the question that I think you know, makes sense is like, well, what do you mean the, the p orbital of a hydrogen atom? Or the d orbital of a hydrogen atom? And this is the point where we can start thinking a little more practically about what we're doing. What we're doing is we're calculating the allowed states. But we aren't necessarily calculating uh, what exists. Because what exists is an electron occupying a state. So an electron can occupy any of these states. We can have a hydrogen atom in which an electron is occupying the you know, 3D states. It's not energetically preferred because it has to be uh, uh, you know, above the ground state, but it is certainly possible. So this whole game of quantum mechanics is to get an expression for the potential and sometimes, well, most of the time, all the time, it's very difficult to do because the potential actually depends on the electrons, but 
if you can write it out, alkyl electrons, say, okay, what does the potential look like? And then you occupy with electrons, and they occupy these states according to uh, according to Fermi Dirac statistics. Uh, but let's think about uh, what else we know. What else we know is we know that electrons are fermions, and uh, that means that they have this Pauli exclusion principle that they have to obey. And if we start occupying these, the first electron goes into here. And then the second electron, it goes into here. And that violates what we understand. So right away, even though we solved this, we know that it can't be right. We're missing something. And it so happens, if you take this 1s state and we apply an electric, a magnetic field, What's going to happen is this state is going to split into two states. It's degenerate. And there's a little delta here. And that delta uh, is proportional to the magnetic field. Uh, this is called the Zeeman effect. And the Zeeman effect is telling us that the electrons interact or degenerate, but they interact with a magnetic field like that. Which means that we miss something in the uh, expression for the angular momentum. And we fix that by saying, well, we missed something. Or we miss uh, spin. We had a spin. Spin, again, it's not physically meaningful. It's just a term that we use to correct the wave function for this effect. We have some additional quantum effect that influences the magnetic behavior, and we call that spin, which means we have also now this chi ms, which is means that now our wave function is going to be n, l, m, m, s. So we have four quantum numbers. And this spin quantum number can take two values, plus 1 half or minus 1 half for spin up or spin down. So that means that when we start drawing in the occupation of these states. We don't draw you know, little dots anymore, but now we draw in up, down, up, down. So we're specifying uh, ms plus 1 half minus 1 half plus 1 half minus 1 half. Okay, so when we include spin, we still have a lot of degeneracy. And in fact, for a given n quantum number, there are two n squared degenerate states. tell you without proving it that these come about from relativistic corrections. We, we lift the degeneracy. Second, 
we have a relativistic correction that's called the uh, L dot S coupling. This has to do with interaction between the orbital uh, angular momentum and the spin angular momentum. And third, we have the Darwin term. And the Darwin term is, uh, is purely a uh, quantum effect. It doesn't have a, a physical meaning. Uh, and yes, it is that Darwin. But actually not him, it's his, I think it's his nephew. Uh, so it's, it's in the same family as the Darwin Darwin. But uh, later in life, his family went on to higher things. Uh, So let's see. That's where I'm going to leave it. Uh, what I say is, uh, and so goes the rest of the periodic table. <laughs> but it is not that simple, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, but we do have the, the rest of the periodic table solved, and it's been solved numerically. Uh, but this, this is how it's done. Questions about hydrogen?